Hey, welcome to our uh, Camino Wildlife Habitat uh, third Wednesday of the month program. And before I introduce you to Neil, I just want to tell you a little bit about our Camino Wildlife Habitat project. So we, we do these programs to uh, let people know more about the, the birds and the critters, as well as landscaping for wildlife. And this is a bit of a mix. So uh, before before we get to our program, let me just tell you about our Kamena Wildlife Habitat Project, which we're pretty pleased with. Our island in harmony with nature, one yard at a time, and we are now up to 1,006 certified wildlife habitats on the island, which is very cool. And um, we, we're doing this project because of all the habitat loss. And when you have certain regulations in the state or the county or the city where people live, whatever, um, certain things are allowed. And the Backyard Wildlife Habitat Project is a citizen action step that we can take and communities can take so that even though some things are being developed, we can still do things in our yards. So like in the map with the 1984 versus the 2020, some of those spaces that are really, um, have really been developed, some of those backyards could be brought to um, to a more of a wildlife habitat linking backyards together and then and then some green could come back into the map. So that's why we're doing this. This is our action step rather than weeping and sobbing when the logging truck trucks roll off the island, we are thinking of ways that we can restore our corridors and link our backyards. So what you can do in your yard is think about um, ways that you can take away the grass. So in my yard, this is the before is actually a mid stage. The, uh, the true before would be a stage where everything on the left of the pathway would be grass and everything on the right of the pathway would be grass. And now, and so, we, and we did it in increments. So we, we first had like little boxes of, of planting areas and then we just took out the whole left side of the pathway. And we have shore pine and salal in there and it, it's, it's pretty, grown up and like a little forest there. And then the right side that's grown in as well. And I can tell you on those hot summer days, we had a nice green lush landscape up there and it didn't feel hot. While the neighbors to the north and the south have lawn and that was just brown and kind of dead. So, so the backyard wildlife habitat not only helps the critters, it also allows people to have a little oasis. And to do it, you just have to think about the four basic needs for wildlife. So it's providing food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. And the food, shelter, and places to raise young, all that can be done with the plants you put in your yard, even to the water to some extent. I know that, um, that logs and uh, that fall into the yard, the nurse logs, they have water in it for some of the, the bugs and, and little things. And I went, we had a garden tour, and I saw in one of the leaves um, of this, this big plant in, in the very center, there's a little pool of water and there was a frog sitting on that leaf. So there's lots of ways to get water. Um, but the, the simple way to put it up is to have a bird bath and, and it can be as simple as the bottom of a planter with some rocks and, and, and gravel so that it's not slippery and that it's not a steep slope. So there's simple ways to get water because the first, the food shelter and places to rain, Raise young is pretty simple to do just by leaving things on Kamena with and, and not taking the, the native plants out. So besides what we um, plant, uh, there's other things to think about. And and this, well, I'm talk, besides what you plant, I say reduce lawns and grow natives. But in addition to that, that's conserving water on the island, um, the reducing or eliminate Nating pesticides, sometimes people think that they can't be a backyard wildlife habitat because they might be using some chemicals still. But you need to think of things as a work in pro process. So you don't have to be perfect right away, but by doing a backyard wildlife habitat, you certainly become more um, careful about what you're doing and more conscientious about what you're doing. So maybe in some time, you will be to the point where you can eliminate the pesticides and reduce the fertilizer use and such. So it's kind of an impro a process in how you, um, how you grow as a landscaper for wildlife. And composting is another way. And oops, 
I, I, I switched over and I, I think I, oh, I can go back with my arrow. And then um, the restoring the habitat loss is a big deal. So when I show you the map, you can see that all these um, habitats are all throughout the island and, and they really can restore some corridors. If you think about your property as, in, as, um, as like Russell Link mentions in his book, Living with Land or Landscaping for Wildlife, that you have zones and you have your back parts of your property that you don't use much can be more wild. And if all those backyards are linking together, then you actually are restoring corridors. So to certify as a wildlife habitat, it's pretty simple. It's a simple application where you're just checking off how you're providing food, how you're providing water, how you're providing shelter and places to raise young and practicing responsible gardening. And like I said, this is a work in progress so that you may have just a few checks enough to qualify at the beginning, but uh, in a few years you might be able to check off everything. And, and not that you ever have to, but there's, there's ways to, um, to certify you become part of a um, part of something that's kind of cool on our island, our Camino Wildlife Habitat Project with the thousand six people that are doing it, um, and then part of a national project where there's 250,000 plus doing it, and there are, are 18 communities in the state doing it and 140 in the nation. So to certify, you can also, um, once you do that, you can get one of our pretty signs. The artwork's by Bev Paulson, a, a local artist, well, she passed away, but um, she did this beautiful toe that's smiling for us. And um, you can also get Ranger Rick. And this is a way to sort of show that your certified wildlife habitats sometimes are a little messier because you're leaving the seeds on and you're not cleaning things up um, like you would in a little perfectly manicured lawn. But by having a sign and some yard art, you're giving purpose to the, the what some view as messiness which isn't necessarily messy. So here are all the dots on our island of people certifying. This is with 695, so we have 300 plus more dots to add to the map. So um, that's a lot of work, so we just use our old map and tell you there's a lot more dots to be added. These are the communities that are certified. Kamena was the second in the state. Tukwila was the first and kind of spurred everybody else to participate because if Tukwila could do it, um, then uh, Kamena, we thought we didn't even have to restore so much. We were just getting people to keep what they have on the island. And so it's a, a pretty cool project. And you could say that, uh, that the Puget Sound region is a regional wildlife habitat. And you can get more information from the National Wildlife Federation, which certified us as a community, and then also on our website. And just a little note about our website, we had to change it because um, Google was doing something different with the website. So um, I think, that, and so we have um, a newly designed website and Roxy did that and it's really well done and it's really a kind of a treat to go through. So if you, if you haven't checked out our new website, do that. She's even added some um, other events from different communities and our different um, organizations and there's ones on forest that if you look under other events on our website or go to just come into wildlife habitat and take the link you can see two activities that are working with forests and um, forest stewardship that's coming up pretty soon like there's something tomorrow a zoom tomorrow about slopes and then the forestry workshop is i think was it november 3rd roxy so um, it's the November 6th is the forest workshop, and tomorrow night is the vegetation management for shoreline. Yeah. So if you're interested, oh, sorry, one, Roxy, go ahead. Sorry, the, tomorrow night is a Zoom workshop, and the other is in person. So the, if you want to know more about slopes and what you can do with slopes, which it's specific, they, they're gearing it to people that have waterfront, but it works for slopes anywhere on, what, on how to um, plant on slopes. And there's so information that, in the chat, sorry. Okay. And then these are some reference books. The Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife are done by um, Russell Link. And he's a fish and wildlife biologist for the state. And so they're, they're pinpointing for the Pacific Northwest. And then the Attracting Birds 
and Butterflies is the National Wildlife Federation's book about wildlife landscaping. And with that, so welcome to our program and I want to introduce you now to Neil. And thank you for coming. Oh, one other thing, that in November, our November 17th program, we will have a program about um, Montana, I was going to say a tree name, Montana Napier, from, she's the Kama Beach Interpretive Specialist, and she's going to talk about how we can be um, good users of the parks when we go to the parks and, and to enjoy them and still give the wildlife space. So that's what her presentation will be on in November. So now I will stop sharing and I will introduce you to Neil. So Neil Zimmerman, he's given programs for both our, our Wednesday programs as well as for our Habitat Stewards training. And he is a hit every time he speaks for us. We get a lot of information and we learn a lot about birds and it's just a joy to have him be willing to give us yet another presentation. He's the Seattle Audubon Outreach Chair and he also is a master birder. So welcome, Neil. Thank you so much for another presentation for us. Thank you, Val. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about some of the same thing that Val was just talking about. Uh, one of the things I like is that our yard is actually National Wildlife certified too. And I like the idea that when my neighbors walk by, they don't think I've just gotten lazy. I actually have a plan. And the sign kind of helps show that off. And also, when I first started doing this years ago, that it was hard to find a, a book on Washington State. You could find books on how to attract cardinals and things like that. But when Russell Link came out with his books, they were books that were geared to the Pacific Northwest, which I think was really a great thing. So uh, I'm just glad to be here. And uh, you'll see as I go through my yard that uh, I've gone to great lengths to change my yard to attract birds. Uh, I haven't owned a lawnmower in about 25 years. And uh, like she was saying, I've been with Seattle Audubon for over 30 years. I went through the first master birder program. I lead field trips, bird walks, Christmas bird counts, all that kind of stuff. So we'll get started with that. This is, uh, can everybody see this? I'm, I got to share it. So this is a great little bird here. One of my favorite birds. This is the red-breasted nuthatch. Uh, Typically, sometimes its name is the upside down bird. You can see it's got the perfect position here. I love these birds, especially in the springtime when they bring their youngsters because they have this little chat. They, they, they're kind of chittering the whole time when they come as a family. So they're really cool birds to see. So this is what a uh, traditional garden normally is. Uh, this is a house down the street from us, a relatively new house. Uh, not a whole lot, beauty bark, a few roadies, a couple of trees. And to his credit, he has done some work, putting a lot more plants in. But a plant like a uh, yard like this really does not going to bring a whole lot of birds. So a lot of people think that clean and tidy is the way to go, but it's really barren of life. You're not going to get a lot of birds or a lot of life in a yard like this. But a yard like this, this is our front yard, uh, is, is full of birds. Uh, I was just talking before we were talking about this here is a pyracantha and right now it's full of orange berries and there were probably 20 birds in those bushes today eating up the berries. And we got started in our yard. Uh, Seattle Audubon used to do an informational booth at the Flower and Garden Show back in the day where you could get free entrance uh, to staff the booth. They don't do that anymore, haven't for years, but we learned a lot of things down there probably you know, I always tell people, don't ever take your wife to the Flower and Garden Show. It's not a good idea. But we came back with all these ideas. We got rid of the, uh, the lawn, put in a lot of paths, raised beds. And we have a lot of plants that attract birds and also uh, just make the yard really nice. So these are some of the rules for wildlife friendly the garden. I'll talk about each of these a little bit as we go along. The first one is stop using chemicals, basically pesticides and, and fertilizers. Then my favorite one is stop cleaning up. And the last one is plant more plants. So most insects are beneficial, like this beautiful swallowtail butterfly here. Uh, I've read everything from some say 95 or 98% of all insects are beneficial. 
So when you start using pesticides, you basically uh, impact a lot of insects that are important. And pollinators are especially important. You've all heard about colony, bee colony collapse and uh, the hummingbird, I mean, the honeybees are in distress. And a lot of that, they blame that on pesticides. They say that the average homeowner uses more pesticides than, than farmers do per square acre. So what I'm trying to, I'm, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but we're trying to just talk a little bit about pesticide reduction or stop using pesticides. Indiscriminate use of pesticides is, is really harmful to the environment as a whole. Because if you want to attract birds to your yard, you kind of have to throw in the towel on insects and invite insects into your yard. Uh, this is a, a male northern flicker. I can tell it's a male because of the red mustache. The females don't have a red mustache. And this is a bird that feeds a lot on ants. So this is a bird you'll see in your yard a lot on the ground of foraging for ants. And they're also a bird that when I do outreach in the springtime and people walk up, I can say northern flicker half the time and I would be right. Because the question is, what's that bird hammering on my chimney cap? Basketball backboards. So woodpeckers don't net really sing to attract mates, they drum. So they're drumming away up there to attract mates, to declare territory. I bet people say that bird is so dumb, he'll never find insects in there. Well, he's not looking for in insects. He's looking to pick up chicks, basically. So this is a great bird. I always love this one because it looks like someone took a magic marker and just dotted up the front. So that's the male northern flicker. And nature recycles debris right where it falls. This is a picture from Discovery Park. And, and I don't know anybody's going to want their yard to look like this, but this just kind of illustrates how things are recycled in nature. But this is a picture from my backyard. This is from a years ago when I started out. I had some bare dirt. And I bought one of those leaf backs that you kind of suck up leaves and they mulch it. And what I would do is I would take those leaves and I would pile it up in our yard on the bare dirt because the leaves are very important for birds to forage in and it helps keep the moisture in, kind of acts as a compost and keeps the leaves down. So one of the birds that you'll see in that leaf literally are fox sparrows. Uh, they're a bird of the winter time. They come down in the winter and they and towies have an interesting way of foraging because they'll get in the leaves and kind of jump backwards. So the leaves go flying backwards then they quick look down to see if there are any insects they've uncovered. So sometimes you'll see the leaves out there just flying around as the fox sparrows and the towies are out there foraging through the leaf litter. So I try not to clean up. I try to keep the leaves as much as I can. I don't keep them on our driveway and our sidewalk, but any place else they land, I pretty much leave them until spring. Sometimes I have to take them up because they get so many that they start suppressing the growth underneath them. The, hyacinths and stuff like that. Another thing you can do is all the plants that go to seed, you can leave those for the winter time. My neighbor has a beautiful area of uh, black eyed Susans, but every year she, in the fall, she just did it last week. She goes and clears out everyone, cuts them all down. But those birds that are, love the seeds, you know, they'll get in there and clean up the seeds. And a lot of annuals, especially even perennials, they will have seeds that you can leave and clean up in the spring rather than clean up in the fall. Because one of the birds that you'll see in your yard, and probably the most common bird in the wintertime in our backyard is the dark-eyed junco. Uh, this particular one is a male. Juncos like robins and towies, the males have black heads. So you can actually sex the robins, towies, and, and juncos by the color of their head. And they typically, the females have more of a grayer head and not a, a black one. But this is a dark eyed junco male. And right now, we know it's a sure sign of fall when our 30 juncos show up in our backyard and they kind of twitter away. So they're very active right now. So a yard like this, you can see, is probably not going to have a whole lot of plant diversity. But this is another picture from our yard. Uh, and it's you can see I've planted, it's maxed out with plants. I, when I go to plant sales now, I don't, I don't buy any plants because I don't have room for plants. I spend more time pruning than I do planting, that's for sure. And in the plant world, there is a saying called right plant, right place. 
which basically means do a little research on the plants that you want to plant or you want to put in so that you get them in the right soil conditions, the right moisture conditions, or uh, the sun and shade. And you also don't want to plant invasives. This is a uh, butterfly bush. And these used to be very popular uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. But they've been declared uh, Nox, B class Noxus weeds in both Washington and Oregon now because they've gotten away into riparian areas and just gone crazy. They, they become a monoculture, pretty much crowd everything out. So the other ones that you see a lot is the English ivy, the English laurel, and the English holly. So it's kind of the revenge of the English, I guess, but you go out into the woods around here and it doesn't take you long to find all three of those species in the woods because one of the problems is that the birds plant them. They eat the seeds and go out there and drop them. So they're really helping out the problem of invasives by uh, planting them all over the place. So uh, we like to push the native plants of the natural choice. The native plants have evolved with our dry summers, our wet winters. They've uh, evolved with our, our pests. So they're a good choice, and especially this last year where it's been so dry, uh, I didn't really, I did water in some of my bigger trees because I was worried about losing those. But the ferns and the plants like that, they don't really need a whole lot of water. Those still stay green. I'm just going to talk about a few of the plants that I have that are, are, are common plants, easy to find, uh, common in our woods around here, and are very beneficial for, for birds in your backyard. And this one is a salal. Uh, I like this one. I like plants that are that flower and easy to prune and generally are evergreen. So I like to kind of stay with those. Uh, the salal gets these little flowers on them here and they get those nice deep purple berries and they grow really well. I can say this is one that I just, I don't do any more than prune this because if I, I think if I didn't, my whole yard would be salal. But there, it's a great plant. Uh, my toe is in one section, the toe is nest in it. And you're, they're always out there eating the berries this time of the year. So I love the salal. Kinnikinnik is a great uh, um, substitute for English ivy. It's a plant that the, you see a lot in uh, commercial landscaping. The reason being that it's uh, drought tolerant, uh, likes the sun, grows out horizontal, gets these great little, uh, little pink flowers on them that also turn into little reddish orange berries in the fall that the birds will eat. It's also a great name, Kinnikinnik, it's just, it's just a great name. Another one I like is a red flowering current. I like this one uh, because this one in the fall, in the springtime, it seems like the flowers come up almost before the leaves do. And though they're not really a, a hummingbird shaped plant that you typically think of, the hummingbirds are attracted to these quite a bit. Another one is the Oregon grape. This is the Mahonia. It comes in tall, short, low, all kinds of different kinds. I have a couple different kinds. This is the tall one. I have a couple short ones. I cannot, I can't ever remember the uh, Latin name for them. Aquafolium, I think is the tall one. But they have great yellow flowers on them. And I've seen the hummingbirds come to these flowers, but I don't think that they're actually getting the nectar out. They seem to be gleaning insects from the flowers. And this is one of the plants that when you prune these, you, you really need to wear gloves because they will, they will draw blood because those, those uh, leaves, especially when they're dry, are quite sharp. But they grate these great berries here and a lot of birds will eat these. I was surprised to see pileated woodpeckers and flickers out on the, Salau, uh, on the Oregon grape kind of weaving and back and forth or plucking off the berries. They really like them. I can tell the plants in my yard, which are really popular by how long the berries last. And the uh, Oregon grape, the berries don't last very long at all. And there are different plants, uh, perennials that you can grow. I like perennials because I don't have to keep planting them. Purple coneflower and black-eyed Susans, though considered native plants, really aren't native to at least the area I live in because the area I live in, Briar, is normally would be a bunch of big trees and not very sunny, but you get into the, any of the plains or drier areas, these plants are considered natives. 
I like them because like the purple coneflower here is almost like a mini sunflower seed. It gets all these seeds in there and the juncos in particular seem to like them. I see the juncos get on top of the plants and kind of weight them down to the ground and then go through and pluck out all the seeds. They don't last very long either. I noticed just the other day that a lot of the uh, seeds are already plucked out and they've only gone to seed just like a week or two. So this is a winter green. This is another great uh, substitute for English ivy. It doesn't grow very tall. It grows about 12 inches, gets little bell shaped flowers on it and then gets these nice berries on uh, during the fall. Uh, vine maple is a, is a common tree. You go in the woods around here, vine maples are very common. I have a couple in my yard. They're considered a weedy tree, not that they grow like weeds, but they're multiple stem, not a, a one trunk. But I like them a lot because during the fall, they uh, have a lot of great colors. And then the maples have those seeds, the, the little helicopter seeds that you see flying around. And a lot of birds that go through those. I've seen, uh, for a while, one year, we had evening grosbeaks, beaks, and they were here going through the uh, seeds. And the squirrels love the seeds. And here's a couple more that I really like. Uh, I have these in our yard. I like the uh, deer ferns because the deer ferns aren't as big as sword ferns. I have a, several sword ferns, but sword ferns, sword ferns, as you know, they can get six feet high, six feet wide. They can get massive, but deer ferns are a little more petite and I like those. And they're interesting because the area down here, the fronds are sterile and they're evergreen. But these fronds up here are where the uh, spores are and they're deciduous. So they die off every year. So it's kind of a combination of deciduous and evergreen foliage on the same plant. They don't get very big, three feet wide, three feet tall. And I like them, like I say, because they have kind of a dainty look to them. And another one I really started to grow fond of is the Pacific Wax Myrtle. Uh, I've got two of those that have gotten to be pretty good size now. They're about 20 feet tall, 20 feet in diameter. But they get these kind of little waxy berries on them. And they, they kind of grow right along the stems or the twigs. And these are really popular. Uh, last winter, I had, I think, about seven yellow rump warblers in there. They really love these. In fact, the yellow rump warblers used to be two races, the Audubon and Myrtle Warbler, and they got their name Myrtle Warbler because out east they like to eat these berries. They're kind of a waxy berry and they're very popular. I noticed the other day I have a couple of yellow rumps out there again, along with uh, the very thrush and the uh, actually the crows really like them too. And then there's evergreen huckleberry. I have several of these that uh, get these great little BB sized berries on it. Uh, the birds really love. My two and a half year old granddaughter loves them. We were out picking them the other day. I've, I've taught her not to eat the green ones, just the purple ones. So she loves those, but the, so do the, the birds and they, they stick around for a while. They, they're, they're really nice plants. Now I've talked a lot about natives, but I can't not talk about non-natives. I've spoke at Mobax a couple of times. So I, you can't talk about just natives when there are literally 10,000 non-natives in the room next to you. But one of the ones I really like is a hardy fuchsia. Uh, they grow into really nice big bushes and the flowers are really, really liked by the hummingbirds. And these really last a long time. I mean, it's, it's almost November now and my fuchsias are still full of, uh, of uh, flowers and the hummingbirds are still working the fuchsias over. So I really like those. So when you get started, you kind of, you know, how do I get started? So inventory what you have. Now, our yard isn't that big. It's about a third of an acre. We live in Briar. It's bigger than a lot of the ones in Seattle and stuff. But these are some of the things that we had and that we wanted to kind of change. And the, the view of the neighbor, two-story house right behind us. So I put in the myrtles, wax myrtles and different plants. So they don't see us and we can't see them. The old dog kennel, uh, someone asked me once, well, how old is your dog? And it's like, well, it's not that. It used to be a dog kennel. So I've taken that out and putting plants there. The bare dirt, I have put in a lot of plants there as, as well as covered up the bare dirt with the uh, 
uh, leaves. And this tree right here, you'll sh I'll show you a little bit, but that's where our Western screech owls nest. And we got rid of all the grass because our grass was basically moss with grass growing and it wasn't grass with moss and it was the other way around. Then we had this big English laurel that uh, was quite a process, but we were able to cut it down, dig it out of there. And I am fortunate that we have a couple of really big trees, big cedars, uh, hemlocks and dug firs in our yard. So then you started thinking, well, okay, what, what's next? Like I say, after many years of going to the flower and garden show, I had a kind of general idea of what I wanted to do. And what I did is I kind of started around the outside and planted there. And like I think Val said that if you plant next to your neighbor's fences and that has plants, you kind of like double your plants right there because you, you make that little corridor. So I try to plant plants up against the neighbor's plants, though unfortunately the neighbors don't have a lot of plants but I tried to make use of that. Then when you go to the flower and garden show, one of the things you always see are these paths going through the gardens there, the display gardens. So I decided to put in a, a path and, and I'm really happy with the paths because when people go in our backyard, I don't have to say go explore. They just start wandering around the path. And I try to cap it to, into kind of like what they call in the flower and garden room. So I have plants, different plants in different areas. Then I put in a dry stream bed at one time, I had this great idea of I put in this pond, I dig this pond, and then I'd maintain the pond and all that. And I, I'm not doing that. So we went with the dry stream bed, and that's actually worked out pretty good. And I'll show you a little bit later, but we have a little water feature right here that's really a big hit. So a lot of times when I give this talk, when the people are leaving, the women are all so excited, and the husbands are looking at me like, yeah, thanks, buddy. Because all of a sudden now they got all their work cut out for them. But it's not something you do over the weekend. I think Val said this earlier. It's an ongoing process. It took me 25 years to get our yard to where it is. And it was just a little bit kind of learning as I went. When I started out, I didn't know much about it at all. But I kind of went a little at a time. And some plants worked, some plants didn't. So it's just a, you got to look at it long term. So this is how I got the backyard started. I uh, dug a little trough here, brought in four tons of river rock uh, in a wheelbarrow out of an old truck. And uh, how I got rid of my grass was I, grass is really hard to dig up. It's super hard to get rid of. So what I found out is I covered it with cardboard. I was working in construction and there was a bunch of cardboard boxes. So I brought them home. You can use newspaper. That's what I used on some of these plants that I got started with. But cardboard is much easier because you can wheel your wheelbarrow across it. And it doesn't rip and doesn't blow away. So I use cardboard. So I put in the dry stream bed. Uh, we got a piece of uh, uh, driftwood. It's kind of a stump that I put there. Kind of the head is the head piece. And planted some of the plants that I wanted right off the bat. And some of the, here's some of the plants I put in back here to get rid of that uh, two-story house back there. Then this is what it looked like. This has always been about 10 years ago now. It looks similar, but some of the plants have come and some have gone. Like I said, I'm not all native plants. The woman across the street has had these great bearded irises and they look great along the stream bed. So I put those in. But I have red flowering current here. You can see one of the red flowering currents is, oh, this is actually a, a miniature uh, azalea that I have in there. And just a lot of plants all the way around. So my path is going all the way around the outside out here. So you kind of want to consider different layers as you plant because different birds like different layers. On the shrub and ground layers you have, that's where you'll find your wrens and thrushes, song sparrows, towhees. They like to be generally down low. But I always say, though, that towhees in the springtime, they forget that they're ground birds because they like to get up in trees and sing. But that's about the only time you'll see them more than like 10 feet off the ground. So then there's the mid-story canopy, and that has an, a whole other host of birds that like to be in that area. And then the last one, which is the hardest one to grow, is the upper story. Uh, you know, we have these big trees, but if you don't have big, big trees in your yard, 
it's chances of you seeing them big if you plant them now are pretty slim. But a couple of trees like the uh, Western hemlock, they actually grow pretty fast. And so do the cedars, but the Western hemlocks grow relatively fast. So it'll still be 15, 20 years before they grow tall enough to be considered upper canopy, but they will grow. And this is a slide that I got from, uh, from the zoo. And this kind of just illustrates what I've been talking about. And of course you want the shorter stuff in front and then the mid story and the upper canopy in the back so you can see it all. But this is really gives you a large variety of bird species because uh, like I said, they like different levels. And this is one of the most uh, common warblers in our, in our state. This is the yellow rump warbler. They winter here in small numbers. Uh, in the birding world, they have a nickname Butterbutts because of that yellow rump. Uh, and I mentioned before, last year we had quite a few here and most of the time they were feeding in the myrtles. And, they, and this is a bird that winches here in small numbers and the Christmas bird count at Discovery Park, we always get you know, about 100 or 120 every, every time we do the count there. They like to feed on some of the ornamentals that are planted down there. And this is a bird that just about everybody knows. This is a bird that's on coffee cups and greeting cards. And, and it's really a friendly, you know, considered a friendly little bird. Black capped chickadees, they, they have a great little call. And they come and go a lot. Something I learned about them not too long ago is that during the wintertime, you see these groups of chickadees. And you think of these chickadees, oh, that's cute. It's a nice little family group. But what I read, they're not family groups, they disperse. So they're little groups that you see in your backyard are generally unrelated uh, chickadees. They're from different families and they just come together. So they're not that little mom, pa group that you think of, they're a bunch of distinct individuals. Another bird we're all familiar with, if you're from back east, which a lot of people are, you call these blue jays, but they're actually blue and they're a jay, but they're not blue jays. They're Stella's jays. This is a friend, uh, a picture, a photo of mine, a friend of mine took that I really like because it really shows the blue eyebrows that Stella's jays have. The Stella's jays in the Rockies and in Arizona, they have white eyebrows. They're like a different race of Stella's jays than we have. But they're beautiful birds. I think they're just as beautiful as the Eastern blue jay because they, they have these great dark feathers and these beautiful blue colors. And this is a bird that's uh, pretty common around here. It's, uh, it's called a Buick's wren. It's, when I first moved here, I, I'm sure it was a Buick's wren, but it's, it's a, called a Buick's wren. They have a lot of different calls, amazing a lot of calls. But anytime you hear a bird making a real buzzy noise, bzz, bzz, kind of, it's, it's generally a, a wren of some sort. They make a, a call, a buzzy call. And they've been nesting in my yard for years. But the funny thing is that they've hardly ever used a birdhouse. I've had them nest in uh, pots. Uh, my kid's uh, bike helmet was hanging on the side when I side shed. They used the inside of the bike helmet a couple of years. They had a hard hat back there. They nested in that. They nest every year, but I've never seen them in a box. I don't know. <laughs> they just don't like boxes, I guess, not around here. And then as you start getting a lot of birds in your yard, you're going to attract some predators. This is a sharp shin hawk. Their larger cousin is the Cooper's hawk. Uh, they belong to a family of birds called the sipiters. They have long tails, relatively short rounded wings, and they're designed to chase birds down through the woods. And that's what they're good at. They're the ones that are at, in most people's feeders. Uh, we, have, we don't get sharpies here very often. We do have Cooper's hawks. To me, they're kind of like uh, having a lion or tiger in your backyard. You, you got the top of the food chain. So uh, to me, it's always excited. To, and they have to eat too. So I like to have the predators in the yard. But things you can do to help protect the birds from especially the coopers and stuff and from cats is to add a brush pile. Now, this is not something you're going to want to have in the middle of your front yard or something. But if you got a corner in the backyard, like this is in our yard, I just pile up the branches kind of loose so that the birds can fly in there, get away from predators, get away from cats, 
And then they also spend, especially the song sparrows, they'll spend a lot of time foraging underneath there. You don't want it too tight. You want it so it's fairly loose so the birds can come and go. If it gets too tight, it kind of turns into a little rat hotel. So you want it loose. And this is the song sparrow I was talking about that are forage underneath there. This is our probably most common sparrow we have around here. It seems like every thicket, uh, blackberries or something, has at least a song sparrow in it. Uh, interesting bird because supposedly they have, in the United States, they have like 120 different dialects. Their songs are just slightly different from area to area. And they vary a lot in color. Back in the West, in the Midwest, or in the East, they're very tan. Ours are very dark brown. And another thing you can do is add water because you'll attract birds that won't come to the feeders, uh, but they'll come to water. And this is an example of a, fee, a, a bird bath not to use. This is a slide when I first started doing this, I was given some slides. And I use this one because birds generally don't like slippery surfaces. It's like when you get into your bathtub and it's kind of wet and slippery, birds like to be able to have solid purchase. So if you have something like this, you can use it by putting in some large flat rocks or something. You don't want to fill it with gravel or something because it's important to keep your bird baths clean. So if you have to rinse out the gravel and wash it all that time, it's kind of a pain. But if you have a flat rock or something you can put in there that the birds can stand on where they're using the water, that'll be great. But the best kind of thing to use is what these are called exposed aggregate. Aggregate is the rock and the concrete. And exposed means that they've washed it so that the, the, the aggregate is, is, is visible. And this is kind of a, a classic bird bath here. Uh, it's kind of deeper. I have some of different depths because this one's the great one for the, we get bantail pigeons, the pileated woodpeckers, the robins, they like deeper water. You'll find that the smaller birds really don't like deeper water. They, they don't go in very deep. So this one has sloping sides. So sometimes you'll see there are little birds on the side it's very popular with the bigger bass, especially, like I say, you'll get birds that you normally don't get, especially in the fall when it's been really dry. And this has been a really a dry fall. And I have this one stuck in the front yard. This one is, uh, is like a sandblasted rock. And I have a little dripper on. You can actually see in action is it dripping because the sound of dripping water is attractive to birds. And a lot of my little birds go in here, chickadees, nuthatches, bush tits, because it's not very deep. I have it kind of angled so that the water is really at the front and the birds will get in there and splash around in there. And they'll actually land on the top of the little black pipe, a plastic pipe and drink the drops as they come out. So this is a great one for little birds. Then also we have this little fake stream that we put in here. It's, it's not very big. It's only about nine feet long. And it's not very deep. There's a couple spots where the water's a little deeper than some of the bigger birds, but generally it's pretty shallow. And the hummingbirds love it. They'll get in there and splash around. The other day I looked out and had uh, six bush tits in there. And this winter we had a dozen red crossbills in there splashing around. So they really like to get in there. The sound of moving water is really nice. And some of the, one of the benefits we found that in living in Briar, we're kind of in the city. It, it really cover up, covers up a lot of the uh, city noise. It's kind of like a white noise. We just hear the water running. My mother-in-law never really liked it though because she always said it made her had to go pee, the sound of the water. But this is a great, it's just a, a small pond right here, a circulating pump. So it just comes down and, and it's very, very good for attracting birds. Another thing you can do is add or keep snags. These are snags that I actually brought in and planted in the backyard. The first time I did one, I planted one and put it in concrete and all that. But after about three or four years, it rotted and fell over. And all of a sudden I have this chunk of concrete down on the ground. So I don't do that anymore. Now I just dig a hole and stick them in there and tap it down. And as it rots, I just dig it back out and shove it down. So this one here now is about four feet tall. And this one's probably about the same. And this one is completely gone. I just get different ones and replace them. But the birds really love, especially the woodpeckers. When the woodpeckers come to our bird bath here, they almost always land on the snag 
scope things out and land down here. This one is great. The band-tailed pigeons like to come and land in this, but also the cooper hawk. The cooper hawk likes to sit right out here and scoop out the backyard, scope out the backyard. And the flamingos, those are, uh, they're not yard art. They're more like decoys. One of these days, you always have to be an optimist when you're a birder. And one of these days, that flock of flamingos is going to stop by, and then I'll be looking good. But you can also have trees cut down and made into snags. This particular tree in our front yard was a hemlock that had the top had broken off before we moved in. And when hemlocks are top, they don't grow up anymore. They grow out. This tree was so huge, it almost covered up our whole front yard. So we decided to have it cut down. And the, the uh, arborist came in and cut it down. I told him what I wanted. So he left me some perches. He put a little groove in here. I think he thought maybe that would be for bats or something. But it didn't take long for the birds to uh, start making holes in it. Five or six years. And then one year we had these uh, flickers come in and they raised three youngsters in there. And this particular flicker is very interesting because red shafted flickers, which is the flickers we normally have around here, it's the red shafted race, they don't have red on the back of their heads. Yellow shafted flickers have yellow on the back, red on the back of their heads. So we, a lot of times here in our area, we get what we call intergrades between yellow shafted and red shafted flickers. And the most prominent mark that you see on those birds is this red chevron on the back of their neck. So it's just kind of interesting. If you think you've seen all the flickers, if you start looking at them, you'll notice that they're not all exactly alike. And you can tell this one here is a little male because he already has a red mustache. And this you're probably all familiar with. This is the pileated woodpecker. This is the uh, largest of our woodpeckers. Very vocal, uh, very good at making large, large holes. And woodpeckers are very important. They're like the carpenters of the, the forest because they excavate holes. And part of their breeding uh, ritual is to excavate a hole every year. That's why there's so many holes. They don't normally don't reuse the hole. The male makes the hole, the female comes in and says, yeah, yeah, this will work. Or if not, the male goes and has to make another hole. But then as they abandon, they're used by a whole host of other birds and, and animals. Everything from flying squirrels to raccoons. The pileated makes holes big enough for raccoons. But a lot of the smaller ones, the, the downies and harries, those holes are used by sawwood owls and western screech owls. So woodpeckers and snags are very important part of the natural environment that is really rapidly disappearing from uh, urban areas. In fact, the, the state came up with a, what they call the wildlife tree program. And they're trying to get people to create and save snags. You can get a little sign, a little sheet on how to do it. So uh, again, I got one to stick it out front so that my neighbors don't think I'm saving a dead tree for nothing. But I've had really great success with the couple big snags I've had. Another thing you can do is you can put out boxes. So boxes are basically a substitute for a snag. Normally, the snag would be made by a woodpecker or something in a, in a snag, and birds would use them. But in the urban area, we have very few of those, and the competition in some areas is so high that you can help by putting out a, a birdhouse. This is the very basic birdhouse. It's made out of cedar, which cedar is naturally uh, decay resistant and insect resistant. Uh, this particular one here, for some reason, uh, wood, the uh, squirrel, decided to chew off a large part of the top there. But this has a little screw here. I can unscrew it and this whole side opens up and I clean it out every spring. And the reason you do that is that the nest over time can build up parasites and mites. So I tried to take those and scrape that out and clean it out because the birds will bring in uh, everything they need. You don't really need to bring anything in for most of the birds that the chickadees not actually build their own nests. But then, this is the bird I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, this is a, a Western screech owl. Western screech owls are a bird that's, they're, they're not really common around here because owls in generally aren't common, but Western screech owls is an owl that are preyed on by the barred owls. 
So as the barred owls range has expanded, the Western screech owls have declined. Uh, across the street from us, there was a, a 12 acre green belt for years. It got sold and they put in 29 houses over there. And that's where we always heard the Western screech owls crawling from behind the neighbor's house. So I put up a couple boxes in the first couple of years, I didn't have much luck. But then one year, all of a sudden, a female showed up in the flicker box. And these birds now, we've had them in the flicker box uh, three times and in one of the snags one time. So out of the last, I think, eight years, they've nested in our yard four times. Great birds to have. We hear them calling in the spring. Uh, the female spends most of her time in the box, and you can see her fly out at dusk. So every night we're in our back deck, sitting and waiting to see the owls. And we've seen them in our bird bath. We've seen them uh, flying around a yard. So they're really cool. And here's one of the youngsters, a little puff ball here. And when they branch, they come out. And this particular one, he came out and I got some pictures. And then he started, I could see him actually hiking up farther in the tree. And I never saw him again. He, at least not in this plumage. He uh, went up higher, but other ones have come down and have hung around for a little bit in some of the trees. So I'm not going to talk about feeders too much because feeders is almost a whole new uh, program. But I'll just talk about a little bit. Uh, feeders, it's important to keep them clean. Uh, last year with all the pine siskins, they told us to stop feeding because they spread diseases because they're so social. So we had to stop. So you try to clean them off quite a bit. This one is a, is a peanut wreath. I put peanuts in there. The Stellar's Jays love it. They land in the middle and pluck out the peanuts. This one here is kind of a, got a screen on it. And this is sunflower meats. And this is a log with holes drilled in it that I stick suet in. I like this rather than a regular cage because we get pileated. And pileators don't do well on a small cage, but you, they land on this log and have no problem emptying out the holes. And then this is a, uh, a black old sunflower seed. But, and cats, cats are hunters. Cats are, uh, and a lot of bird forms, uh, internet bird forms. Cats are, you can't talk about cats because people are so polarized on cats. But cats are hunters and cats will kill birds. That's their natural thing. But there are some things you can do to at least kind of slow the cats down. And one thing that I found that has worked good uh, in our neighborhood is I get this green fencing. It's this green wire fencing you see at all the uh, hardware stores and Lowe's and stuff like that. I put this piece of paper behind it so you could see it. But what I do is I wrap the bushes around the feeders and around the bird baths. I wrap them with about 18 or 24 inch high uh, screen and it pretty much the plants grow through it and it pretty much uh, is invisible in the plants. But the cats in my neighborhood, they don't stock as much as ambush. So the cats used to get underneath there and then rush out and, and ambush the birds. But now they have to go up and over and by the time they go up and over, the birds are gone. So it's, it's done a lot to persuade the cats or dissuade the cats, I guess is the word. And I've some, seen some people in pictures of a big, take a big fence of this stuff and put it around their feeders so that the cats can't get underneath the feeders. Another thing you can do, and this is what we did. I have this covered deck and I screened it in with that same screen and you can kind of make it out over here. So our cats are indoor cats, but they have what, and I found this out years ago. It's called a catio. Uh, the cats go out there. They, and they're bird watchers. They spend a lot of time bird watching, but they don't get very many birds. Occasionally, in the springtime, young birds will make the mistake of coming in through the back deck. And there's not much I can do about that. But generally, they don't get any birds. So they don't roam the neighborhood. And, and then when I live in Briar and probably Camano, too, and a lot of coyotes, and there's a lot of stories of people talk about their cats disappearing or people seeing coyotes with cats in their mouth. So it's one way to keep your cat alive and healthy is to keep them inside. And catios come in everything from window-sized ones to elaborate backyard ones. So it's something to consider if you have a cat and you don't want them inside 
their whole lives. So as we start wrapping up this one I showed before, you can see that this is not really bird friendly, but our yard is bird friendly. Here's a few more birds that you can expect to see in your yard. Uh, the pine siskin I talked about last year, very social birds, kind of the cousins of uh, goldfinch. They'll come down in flocks of 20 or 30, but they also spread uh, diseases pretty easy because they're so social. A buried thrush, you're probably all familiar with this. This is a bird that nests up in the Cascades, higher elevations. And in, uh, it's a sign of winter around here is when, they, when the uh, thrush, the buried thrushes start coming down to the lowlands. Uh, chestnut back chickadees. Uh, this is a bird, it's, we, we kind of take them for granted, but this is a bird that people from the east, that's one of the birds they want to see when they come here. And then this is a male house finch, uh, relatively common bird around here and pretty vocal. So finally, you got to remember why you do all these things to attract these birds. Put in a little bench. This is something we got the Flower and Garden show years ago. A uh, little bench somewhere to sit down, have a beer, cup of coffee, a glass of wine. Because it doesn't take long for the birds to get accustomed to you. And they will come around and uh, go about their business and pretty much ignore you. Then I wouldn't be a good Seattle Audubon member if I didn't bring up BirdWeb. BirdWeb is the Seattle Audubon's online Birds of Washington encyclopedia. So if you want to see photos, hear sounds, range maps, brief, brief history, and it's only the birds normally found in Washington. So it's 400, not 800. So you can kind of go through them and it's great for hearing the sounds and finding out basic information about them. So that's all I got. Questions? All right, thank you. So Val, do you wanna host some questions here? Sure, I'll go through. Thanks, Neil, that was a great showing us the birds and the plants as well as what would be a good backyard wildlife habitat. So thanks for that. And here are some questions for you. Um, first, Christina says she loves this. So there's some kudos for you. Well, that's great. I love to hear that. that's why I do it. <laughs> and then have you had any issues with the brush pile attracting rodents? Uh, there is some problem, but this particular one is, I keep it very loose and as it starts settling, I, I, I raise it up so that it's kind of loose. So I don't really get any rats in there. Uh, most of my rats seem to come from my neighbor's uh, wood pile. But I do live trap the rats and try to control them that way. Uh, I actually have more less rats now than when I first moved in because I've been live trapping for years. I like to live trap because it's, it's you know, a, 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 a snap trap kills anything and everything. At least if you get something to live trap, you can decide what you're going to do with it. And, and basically what I do with the, the rats is I drown them in a garbage can full of water. Okay, then um, Christina mentioned many of these birds are what we call in Africa, known affectionately as LBJs, little brown jobs. They all look alike. <laughs> they do, and they can be frustrating, but it's one of those things that... Uh, the, the more you look at them, you'll start noticing the little fine things. Like I can tell a song sparrow, which is the really a little brown job. I can tell those just by the way they fly and just by the way they, the size of them. I've seen literally thousands of them. So it's great to learn those like the song sparrows, because when you see something that's not a song sparrow, that that's the one you really want to check out because it can be something different. It can be a, a Lincoln sparrow or, or something like that, something different. So learn your common birds. So when you see something you don't recognize, you know to really pay attention. Just an aside, I know I was never going to learn gulls and then somebody did a little chart with big gulls and little gulls and color of legs and black um, tips on the wings and then it all became doable. Yeah, I still struggle with some of the gulls, but uh, I'm getting better after all these years. The same thing. If I see enough of them after a while, it, it does start to click. Yeah. Then I love the owls, another comment. And 
Anne's new to the area and she has pretty much undeveloped backyard, an undeveloped backyard with few shrubs, mostly fern maple trees and brush piles. I've set up suet feeders and nectar feeders in my backyard. The problem I'm having is they are about 30 yards from the house, which has large bay windows. I've lost three birds now crashing into the windows when the hawk comes on during aggressive conflicts. I've learned about kaleidoscape. I'm not sure what kind of protection is best, as there's a vast variety of this tape. Do you have any recommendations? My windows are about eight feet, so I have to cover a good amount of area. Well, what I've started using on my windows, it's a piece of tape that comes with little white squares every two inches. So you take it and you kind of roll it out and it sticks and then you peel it off. So your whole window has little white squares every two inches. And it's easy to see through and the birds can see that. But on a window I have out front, which is a, a, a bigger window, I've actually taken kind of a uh, like the, the netting that you find for over raspberries or something. And I put it into a frame and I've stretched it really tight and I put it out there and it's about three inches away from the window. I've not yet had a bird get caught in it. And I know that can be a problem, but it's never happened. But I've had birds and I have it so tight that when the birds come in, they actually kind of hit it and bounce right back off. So since I put that in, I've not found any dead birds in the front. But another thing you can do, I know this sounds kind of, uh, backwards but the closer you move your feeders to the windows the safer they are because the birds don't get up ahead of steam before they crash in the window so if you have them like three foot or four foot they're not going full blast they'll hit the window and bounce off but if they're 30 feet away and they're flying and trying to get away from something they have a head of steam and they'll crash in the windows so they actually say you're better off having the feeders closer to your windows and house and further wow. away. Wow. That's surprising. <laughs> uh, it was surprising to me, but it makes sense because, uh, like I say, they don't build up the head of steam. They're not flying as fast as when they're way in the back. The, the thing about the, the predators, that gets to be kind of a problem, but uh, I, I've since gone to that, those little squares, and that works pretty good. The little decals of, of birds and stuff like that, they don't seem to be very effective. They may be for short term, but the birds get used to them and it doesn't really help uh, get rid of the reflection, which is what the problem is that birds think that they're flying through the great outdoors when they hit the window. So you're trying to break it up so that they can realize that there's a window there. Okay, thank you. And then in my, um, my backyard wildlife email, if you get that, there's the American Bird Conservancy window collision online tools. There's a link to that, or you could just go to American Bird Conservancy, but they've come up with some online tools for window collisions to check out there too. And, um, okay. And also, Anne, that book that we talked about by Russell Link, th that's a great book to tell you the, the plants to plant and all the different things. It's really a great resource. I highly I recommend that. I think I have that. it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have it. I just have to get to it. But um, yeah, I I think when I get a little bit more planting done, um, I probably won't have this problem. But right now, it's just the trees. They're pretty open. And so there's no brush for the birds to fly into, really. Yeah. So they're just going into what they think is more trees. But thank you. Kathleen says, thank you, Neil. That was wonderful. You're welcome. And Barbara says, I hang my feeders on the edge of my roof about three feet out. That way the birds fly to the feeder, not at the windows. Okay, see, yeah, that's that's the that's what I've been hearing the last few years. And that's supposed to work pretty good. I've done it probably huh. for 20 years, and it really does. Plus, it gets the birds in where you can see them really well. Right. Some are a little skittish, but it doesn't take long for them to not even pay attention to you. You can see them without binoculars, and uh, that's the joy of feeding birds is you get a nice close look at them. 
Kathleen was wondering what was the name of the little white squares that you can still see through? Uh, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I got them at Seattle Audubon's office. You could call them and ask them, but it's a, it's a tape that has all these little white squares and you basically put the tape out and, and take a, a credit card or something, kind of squeeze it on. Then you peel off the clear tape and all the little squares stay on there. That's something they used at Seattle Audubon. And uh, from what I've read, that's been pretty effective. I know in my house, it's been pretty effective. Okay, and then um, Christina says, Tom, my husband loved your presentation. So Great. more kudos. Lori says, thank you. That was very helpful. And anybody else with questions or you can unmute and ask a question if you want or. Um, I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I I was uh, putting out seeds, but I I was getting rats, so I've decided, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. So now I've put in uh, suet with the seeds embedded into the suet, and I have birds all day long, just coming through all the time. Sometimes with these little oh. wrens, they come. There must be about twenty of them. They're in a flock, and they'll cover the whole uh, suet. Those are common yeah. bush tits. Bush tits. Oh, that, those are yep. okay. Yeah, they're great little birds. But the suet has solved my problem as far in terms of the rats. Yeah, if yeah, rats can be a problem. The first thing I do is I don't feed any millet because that's a messy seed. The birds throw so much of it out, it ends up on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then almost all my feeders I have now, I have some kind of a tray or something underneath to keep it from going to the ground. But if you go to suet, hummingbird feeders, uh, something like that, and forget about the seeds, you'll still attract birds and water, especially, and, and native plantings. You'll still get the birds, but you'll keep the rodent problem down because they, they won't have all the seeds to clean up. Mm -hmm. And in my house, I get occasional rats, but I, I got squirrels. And I don't think by the time the rats get there at night, there's not a seed left. The squirrels spend all day there. And I keep the amount that goes down to the ground down to a minimum. So they spend a lot of time cleaning it up. So I don't really have much of a rat problem, but mm -hmm. here in the urban area, the rats are a problem. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd like to say, I went to a Kruckenberg uh, Botanic Gardens in Shoreline. Yep. They just had their sale recently. I wasn't able to go to it, but uh, they have quite a, you know, quite a good selection of wild uh, plants there. Yeah, that's a great choice. And then some other places you can go to the Washington Native Plant Society. Mm -hmm. They quite often have sales, but I think like a lot of places, the last two years, they haven't had the sales. Uh, the Snohomish Conservancy District, they used to have uh, sales. We could get really good deals on plants, but it's the kind of thing that the last few years, a lot of those sales haven't got. But there are some places that do sell the native plants. You kind of have to ser search them out. Mm -hmm. uh, places like Mobax and stuff, they don't have quite the selection of native plants I would like. But I go to, uh, uh, what's the one up in Maltby, uh, Flower World. Mm -hmm. They have quite a selection of native plants there. And then there are a few small growers that grow them in their yard or their homes and sell them that, that have some pretty good prices, but you have to search them out a little bit. Uh -huh. How about you, Dub? Anything there? Not that I know of, no. So the Salal Chapter Fall Plant Sale is on now, I think, got, that you can order online and then you pick up in the nursery on October 22nd and 23rd and October and 29th the, and 30th. And the sale ends tomorrow morning. So ah, okay. So if you, you want to do that, you, it's an online sale. So you, you have until tomorrow. And I think it's morning. Pam, do you know? She's muted. Um, uh, uh, I was up there working today. We're putting orders together. Um, I, th I think you're right that you can still order until maybe tomorrow at nine. You have to check the uh, website and see. But yeah. they have a, a huge selection of native plants. And um, and they didn't sell out right away? Sometimes no. They well, oh, there's still some left. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. OK, I'll put it in the yeah. chat. It at 9 a.m. I, I had it on our on that little email. So tomorrow until 9 a.m. you have to order. 
Mm -hmm. Just and go to wnps.org backslash Salal or just Google uh, Salal chapter um, uh, native plant sale. Yeah, and I put the link in the in the chat. Oh, good. Thanks, Roxy. So uh, the, if you don't if you don't want to plant now, which is a really good time to plant, the Snohomish Conservation District plant sale will be on what next February, March. I don't know. That's another really good time to plant before it gets too hot and dry. So watch for that. Get on their mailing list because they sell out early too sometimes. Um, I, I had a question about um, identifying plants in my yard. Uh, you know, I, I'm terrible at doing that. I, I've gotten books with trees, uh, different pictures of trees, and I never seem to be able to identify them. And Pam gave me the name of one person. I was just wondering if like the Sonomish Conservation District or Seattle, Will they uh, help you identify like what's in your yard? And especially I wanna know like what to get rid of, like, because I'm gonna be developing this and I wanna kind of see if there's any invasives there I shouldn't have. And uh, I have plenty of information on what to put in, but um, I wanna get a good start this time, <laughs> so. So oh, it I, I just just for just a second. So the uh, Master Gardeners is a great place to start. Uh, they have a lot of information for you. And uh, sometimes they might be able to find a Master Gardener in your area that might stop by. I can't guarantee that, but I, I know a friend of mine is a Master Gardener and she does that occasionally if it's in her neighborhood. And then what I kind of, I've always struggled with the plants, but just recently I got an app. It cost me like 30 bucks. It's called Picture This, and you just have to take a picture of the plant, and it IDs it, tells it where does it grow, gives you all kinds of information about it. I found out that it's not 100% accurate, but I've always wanted to catalog all the plants in my yard, and I was always never got around to it, was never sure. But with that thing, I walked around a half hour, I cataloged every plant in my yard. So mm -hmm. it works wow. out pretty slick for us. Wow. For us birders, I, I know I should know my plants better, but uh, I just don't know them all. And there's so many varieties. Okay, so good. picture this. Okay, thanks. I like to get rid of wild geraniums. Is there any way to really get rid of them fast and for sure? I'm not familiar stinky with Bob, them. Stinky they, look like butter, they look like butter oh. cups. Oh, oh, so, oh. yeah. Buttercups, ranunculus. The yellow ones? Yeah, the yellow ones. Oh, they're terrible. Uh, talk with our um, uh, Island County Noxious Weed Control person. We Island look on the County. Noxious Weed Control site. Yeah. I've seen him take over people's whole front yards. Yeah. He, he can help you. He's really good. What's okay. his name? I'm, I'm losing his name right now. Bell? Or Noxious Weed Control guy. Oh, Sean, Seth, Seth, Seth. Okay. Yeah. For the Island County. So if you ask the for the Island County noxious weed coordinator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Pam, you were going to say something about um. Oh, the other question. Um, plant identification. Oh, for helping in the yard for plant IDing the what to take out. You said you were you had something. Well, I know Anne, and I was just going to say I'll come over and help her ID her Thank plants. Thank you. I just got the <laughs> message. Thank you. Okay. I'll I'll feed you or something. And <laughs> we'll get we'll, we'll get thank together. You. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other yeah. questions? Well, Barbara says she feeds only, only every few days. That way the birds clean up and the squirrels clean up. And um, for the, to prevent rats. Another thing is to um, like choosing things that are, are like the sunflowers that eat those pretty well. Or removing your um, feeders out for a while. Mm -hmm. So until they, so they don't get accustomed to going there. 
then um, and said, such a great presentation. Thanks so much. And anybody else? No, it was great. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. This was sure. really wonderful. Thanks. It was it was great. I, I loved it's a, it's a subject that's dear to my heart. And I I always like it. A couple of years ago, someone came up to me and said, yeah, I, I planted a couple of snags and the birds just love them. So getting that message out, I'm kind of like Les Schwab or not Les Schwab. What's the uh, <laughs> the investment? One one investor at a time. If I can get one person to do it at a time, I, I've done my job. Snakes are so cool. I, I, your presentations are so nice because they, they they have a lot of different things and how it all merges together um, with the birds. We get bird ID, plant ID, and why the the um, they work. I'm not speaking very well, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you're linking so many different things and getting the message out. It is really nice, and it really is all connected. You can't just do one. That's right, and you get like I say. Plan on enjoying it because that's that's what it's all about. Make sure you can see your feeders. Have a bench out there so you can see the uh, you know what your what all your hard work is accomplished. That's the main thing. It's it's really enjoy watching birds. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. -bye.